I did support them and quite a movement. And uh, I'm so happy today to be able to um, Professor Diana Larry to, uh, to speak to us. Um, Diana is a professor and major in the Department of History at the University of British Columbia and one of the foremost historians of modern China. Her, her most recent publication, including The Chinese People at War, Human Suffering and Social Trans Transformation in China's Republic. And she has so many um, publications that you probably have to search online. I think more than 10 of them, maybe 20 or 30, a lot of them anyway. Her excellent knowledge of Chinese result in Diana become an expert advisor on Chinese affairs to the Canadian government and travel extensively in China and other Asian countries. The topic today is memory and remembrance. Please help me to welcome Professor Terry. First of all, thank you so much for the people who have organized this meeting and for organizing this museum and in, abs in their absence, the people who have organized a museum in Hong Kong. 1989, May and June 1989, for me, not if you weren't even born then, but I was um, already well on, uh, was one of the saddest and most painful periods of my life. It started out with great excitement because we actually felt in April and early uh, May that something really terrific might be happening in China. It was started with a period of great excitement. I never want people to forget that because it was that excitement which made what happened in Beijing afterwards so absolutely terrible. I was in Beijing uh, at the very end of May and went uh, many times, as everybody did, to the square. I, I, I should say in advance, my one weakness in the Chinese field, serioso weakness, is I can't speak a word of Cantonese except for the addresses I stay in in Hong Kong. So I can say Gondok Do and a few other things like that, but I can't speak any, uh, any, can any other Cantonese. But what the greeting then in Beijing was Mayo, have you been to the square or not? And I certainly didn't know a single person in Beijing who hadn't been many times. I was actually out of Beijing to the south when the massacre happened, but I went back and eventually on uh, June the 6th with all of the other Canadians they could round up, we were evacuated from uh, from China, from Beijing. Uh, and most of us who were there just swore that we would never forget this. It was one of the most profoundly sad moments. Very few of us believed either, though, that it would be 25 years and counting before the events of Tiananmen are rectified, which I still believe they will be, and I sincerely hope it will be in my lifetime, but if not in mine, certainly in those of you uh, who were younger than me. Why is it so important to remember Tiananmen? I call it Tiananmen, I actually usually call it Liu Si, but uh, Tiananmen is the more normal terminology. And by the way, I may say, I always find that very, uh, uh, it gives me a kind of, uh, not a nasty pleasure, but it gives, the, it gives me some real pleasure to think that the government has to see the main square in their city associated not with their history, but with a massacre. If you Google it, you'll see that if you Google Tiananmen, the first page or so is entirely to do with the massacre, and then finally you get round to a, a site of tourism. But I'll come back to that in a little bit. What I want to talk about today is something that is now interesting. A great number 
of academics, not just in the Chinese field, but in many other fields of history. And that's the question of memory. What do people remember? What do they commemorate? I've just been to a conference in England, actually, where uh, it was about the memory of war in Asia. And I was the only person working on China. People were working on all kinds of other parts of Asia, talking about uh, war memorials. Some of this is a bit gloomy, war memorials, cemeteries. But more than anything else, understanding and knowing what happened in the past and the importance of knowing what happened in the past for the coming generations. <clears throat> now, you can never tell what gets, what gets fascinating in history, when and why. Um, a long while ago, when I first started, I was always on the outs with my colleagues, because when I first started doing work on China in the 1970s, most people were working on Maoism. One poor colleague of mine, I think he's never really lived it down, wrote a book called Mao and Love, and he, I think, has had to feel slightly anxious about that ever since. I haven't heard from him for ages, actually. But memory is now a very big subject. And with memory, along with memory, also the question of trauma, pain and suffering, and not just individual pain and suffering, but also this trauma of a whole society, collective memory. Quite a lot of this work has come from uh, Europe, the Second World War, remembering the Second World War in Europe. Uh, and the important thing to note there is that what we're talking about often is the age of the people who remember. The people who remember now in Europe, the Second World War, the people in China, I've just finished working on the Civil War, I always choose very sad subjects, are uh, people who are in their late 70s, early 80s, they've got to write it down before they die. So these, you could say, are close to, to the end um, memories. They produced, in Chinese now, just floods of, of um, memoirs of older people, collective interviews. I may say, starting in Taiwan, Taiwan has done more of this, but endless oral history volumes of people who remember one aspect or another of uh, modern history, but always written by people who were in their 70s or even in their 80s. Some of the braver ones have started writing blogs. I must say blogs was a surprise to me in Chinese. I, 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 I read this word, bulogu, and I said, I'm not sure what that means. So I found a friend and I said, this blog, I mean blog, and she said, of course, how could you not know that? So there I was, this dear old guy in his 80s, writing his own blog about his memory was leaving China for Taiwan. That was all he wanted to write about, the agony of the last few months that he spent in China, and then the rest of his life in Taiwan. Now that kind of memory, I'm talking here about the memories of individuals and people, what I'm also going to talk about, though, is state memory, because state memory, especially in a society such as China, controlled by a single dominant party, is a very different thing. The current government commemorates all kinds of uh, different things. Uh, they've got a huge, a vast team of people now writing on the history of the Qing dynasty. When I say vast, they've got, I think, almost 2,000 historians writing on this project. Um, probably, I won't read it, but uh, <laughs> some people may. Anyhow, it's a massive investment. They are still um, commemorating uh, large events. They commemorated, some of you may have been fortunate enough to see the movie made for the commemoration of the 100th anniversary of the Xinhai Revolution. Uh, I couldn't make the DVD that I had work, so I missed it, but it largely consisted of very famous actors and actresses, including many from Hong Kong, playing mini roles in, uh, in this thing. Uh, the person, Sun Yat-sen, I believe, appeared. Has anybody seen that movie, by the way? Yeah. Uh, well, I gather Sun Yat-sen was in it, because he suddenly appeared on the, on the curse list, but 
nothing was mentioned about the three people's principles, uh, democracy, uh, anything like that. Um, and the reason they don't want to do it is quite clear, it's so obvious. This is a regime which can't afford to remember the past for many, many reasons. And I'm just going to go through a, a few of these before we get on to some of the more positive aspects of memory, which I do want to come back to. This is a quotation from one of my favorite, favorite writers, Yen Lian Ke, and I hope many of you have read his, his novels. Uh, this was, he writes also, you should follow this, he writes a regular column in the New York Times. That's absolutely wonderful, which you could read either in Chinese or English. Um, uh, he is just an extraordinary writer and an extraordinary courageous man, still living in China, uh, abs apparently without any uh, great trouble. In today's China, amnesia, that's deliberate forgetting or forgetting because of an illness, trumps memory. Lies are surpassing the truth. Fabrications have become the logical link to fill historical gaps. Even memories of events that have only just taken place are being discarded at a dazzling pace with barely intelligible fragments, all that remain for people to hold on to. Now he's talking in some detail about several different periods in Chinese history. One of the worst, uh, still in uh, no way uh, settled, is actually the land reform in the very early, in the late 1940s, early 1950s. Followed fairly shortly afterwards by the Great Leap Forward in the late 1950s, followed by the dreadful famine in the uh, very early 1960s, followed by the Cultural Revolution. I mean, these are a series of hideous disasters. My colleague Frank Dakota, who works at, the, um, at Hong Kong U now, um, which I must say is a very brave appointment because Frank Dakota has written a whole series of books and he's got another one coming out, each one of which in excruciating detail goes through the horrors of what had happened I slightly, when I read his books, I mean, I admire them enormously, but I think it wasn't absolutely as horrific as that. It wasn't horrific all the way through because some people believed in this. I almost feel he goes a little bit too far. But his documentation, especially of the famine and of the incredible casualties, uh, up to, uh, it's hard to even believe, up to 30 million what we call premature deaths, in other words, people who died earlier than they should have done, is without question. Uh, the Great Leap Forward is also very well covered. It's more a question of mass insanity rather than uh, the famine followed the Great Leap Forward. So in a sense, the people who died in the Great Leap Forward uh, the, it's more a question of the people who died after the Great Leap Forward than in the Great Leap Forward. The Cultural Revolution, and we hardly can bear even now to go into the absolute hideous uh, turmoil. I've just had two friends staying with me. Uh, they're in their 60s now. Both their parents, who were actually dedicated revolutionaries, their father was the first academic, uh, Cambridge graduate in psychology of Chinese ancestry, and he died of untreated illness. One of many, many millions of people who were, in one way or another, done to death. The tragedy just keeps overwhelming one. And then we get to Liu Si, and the most recent, the most memorable of the tragedies. An unknown number of people died, most of them young people in the prime of their life, ready to make great contributions to China, working only for democracy and freedom and against corruption, all of the things that everybody in Canada takes absolutely for granted. 
and yet gunned down on the streets of the capital for that. This happens in other countries too. I'm not going to say it doesn't. But the fact that Beijing should have been so stained by the blood of its own people is something which even now one would think one would be so profoundly ashamed of and disgusted by that something what would be done. Instead, quite the opposite, China is now the hope of British Columbia. We're going to export masses and masses of liquid uh, LNG. Uh, UBC, my university, has just started a program um, whose slogan is China Matters. It actually needs somebody, I think, not the most creative of slogans I've ever heard, uh, but they have decided, and the China Council is not going to address um, any of these issues in spite of the fact that our president is an expert on his academic discipline, his, uh, le the le legal issues around human rights. So I thought I was going to be entirely on my own, but I'm very glad to see that my lovely colleague Henry Yu is coming next week. Tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow. Oh, tomorrow. OK, so there are at least, um, uh, at least uh, two of us, and uh, probably more, but people have other reasons why they want to suppress memory. The reasons for the state to suppress memory are absolutely obvious. This is a state which has a lot of identity problems. Uh, just to go briefly into it, we're talking about a state run by a communist party. I should hasten to say I've never been a communist or even remotely attracted to communism, but I do know that it's supposed to work in the interests of the workers and the oppressed people. I didn't think any party could be further away from doing that now than the Communist Party of China. So they have got very large internal problems in determining what they believe in. Again, that's not uh, uh, unusual, that's uh, quite possible. Canada used to have a party called the Progressive Conservative Party. I always loved that. How can you be both conservative and progressive? Uh, well, if you join our party, you can. So now China has a, a, um, a communist party which looks very like early capitalist uh, capitalism and uh, they're going on quite nicely um, with that. How did they, I wouldn't say how did they get away with it because we know how they get away with it. It's a police state, it's highly controlled and people who disagree go to jail or uh, some of them survive, and I'll come to some of those who survived in a minute or two, but many of them are harshly punished. Another of the reasons, though, that is very important in looking at memory and the suppression of memory is self-censorship. And what you see in China, uh, certainly in anybody who's uh, over, who can remember this, so this would be anybody over about 35, is a vast range of self-censorships. They don't want to say what they were doing at the time. They certainly don't want to say what their parents, their brothers or sisters may have been doing. They are too involved with what's going on in their own lives uh, to be able to say, we were there, we believed in this, this mattered. If you really push people uh, you find not what some people say, that everybody's forgotten about it. No, not at all. If you really push them or if you know them, they will tell you, yes, I just can't talk about it. It would ruin everything for me. I might lose my house, my car, my children's futures. And that's always one of the hugest problems in China, that uh, you implicate your whole family when you get into trouble. Interestingly enough, though, when people get a bit older, and we're still a long way from that with the May four, uh, the Liu Si generation. People can begin to remember it. Recently, many of you will have noticed that the son of Marshal Chen Yi, one of the greatest of the Communist Party's mil military heroes, Chen Xiaolu, now in his late 60s. So he was a red god, obviously. Every, you look at somebody in, your, in their late 60s and you say, I knew you were a red god. Uh, because uh, the great majority of them were, unless they have a really bad enough political background that they weren't allowed to be a red guard. 
which they will tell you right away. I'm, I, because of my father being a writer, I wasn't allowed to be a red god. Everybody else obviously was. Tin Xiao Lu has just come out with an incredible self-denunciation, detailing what he did to his teachers. I don't know whether it was published in China, it was certainly published in Hong Kong, both in English and in Chinese. And one of the things that he did was urge everybody else to write down, everybody of his generation, his friends, the other children of high officials, anybody who can remember it, to write it down and say, this is what we did. This is how we behaved, and we're deeply sorry for it, because he has expressed the most profound regrets. Now, profound or not, he did actually have to wait till he was, he felt in his own chronological time, it was, he was old enough not to get either himself or his father's long gone, anybody else into major trouble. I thought it would possibly produce a great spurt, uh, but so far uh, it hasn't of similar memoirs but I do seriously believe they're being collected. I know people who are doing research. Quite a large number of graduate students are working in this field now, in, in North America, certainly. And um, I suspect many of them are people who um, are of Chinese origin and go back and do interviews in a way that uh, uh, an outsider certainly couldn't. Final reason for self-censorship, and this is a very profound one, and I can see it looking straight at the, at the window, a profound sense of embarrassment shared by many, many people, many Chinese people, that this is the image of China. If you can all see, it's the tanks with the one incredibly brave man in front of them. This is the image of China that everybody knows. Their image is not the Great Wall or uh, beautiful flowers or goldfish or any of the other fully acceptable images of pandas, the ultimate cuddly image, uh, it is a man standing in front of tanks. And that image has been used again and again worldwide by other people uh, talking and thinking about human rights and about decency. Now I've mentioned all those reasons for memory suppression because not to forgive people in any way but to um, make people wonder that this is not something that's good and it's certainly not good for the people themselves. And this is my great sadness in the fact that it's taken so long for any recognition of Liu Su in China. It's not a victory. It's not a victory for the Communist Party. It's not a victory for the Chinese state. It's a very, very sad thing that they feel that this is necessary, that denial is the only thing they can do. And it's even sad, sadder when you think that they've got away with it. When, they, when we realize they think they've got away with it. They can complain, the new ambassador complain once again to the Canadians about receiving the Dalai Lama. Uh, but he hasn't, in what he said, I think, said anything about, um, uh, certainly, he doesn't complain formally about the Canadians and attitudes on human rights. But he sort of makes little threats about, watch out, you know, if you don't behave well, you won't get as so much trade as you want. Um, I always respond with that. The one country that has criticized China relentlessly and always is France. And France has absolutely no problems with uh, trade with China, except for the unfortunate habit of um, knocking off high-end, luxury goods, which uh, continues to outrage the French. You, if you, anybody who's been in Beijing recently will know that um, should you want a nice um, Hermes scarf, you can buy one for a fraction of the cost uh, in Beijing. Uh, although not in Hong Kong, I may say, they, uh, there you pay the full price. Now I wanted to say that there are other ways though, in which what has happened in China not just Liu Tzu, but particularly Liu Tzu, has been remembered. And here I want to talk about three men 
who have the greatest possible admiration from me and from many others. And these are three writers, three writers publishing currently, all of them living in China, all of them writing in the most uh, courageous and often also amusing way about what has happened, uh, certainly uh, since 1949. They're in a long tradition, a tradition which goes back certainly to Usa rather than Liu Su, the May 4th, and includes, of course, above all, um, Lu Xun, but many other writers. The people, I may say, I don't think probably anybody, even me, uh, in my field, could tell you with absolute certainty who was the president of China in 1919. Uh, anybody like to guess? I don't think. But everybody could tell you what happened then in terms of the literary movement and the creation of modern Chinese literature. The first one I've already mentioned, Yen Lian Ke, this incredibly wonderful writer whose most recent book is a strange book, but absolutely wonderful. It's called Lenin's Tears. I strongly advise everybody to read you. It has some of the absolute insanity of the Communist Party and of commemoration, which is why I mentioned it. It takes place in a mountain village where the people decide they haven't got any tourist mecca. Everybody else has something which brings them to the village, you know, a spring or a famous peak. They've got nothing. So instead, they, they build a tomb to Lenin, the founder of communism. <laughs> and um, people come in flocks. Then they get into all kinds of difficulties. You have to read it. It's hysterically funny. But it also shows you just within that humor is the sense also of the tragedy of the complete lack of knowledge of modern history that certainly these peasants have, and also of this bizarre form of control that the party has, where they can't forbid a, t a memorial to Lenin, even though nothing in it has anything to do with uh, socialism. The second writer is my favorite writer of all, uh, Yu Hua. Yu Hua has written a series of wonderful books, some of which have been made films. Uh, to Live, Huo Zhe was one of the early ones, which is a fantastic film covering China from the Japanese anti-Japanese war right through till past the Cultural Revolution. His most recent work is not a novel. It's um, an analysis of language. It's called China in 10 Words. And I advise you as strongly as I possibly can to read this because you get from that a sense, again, of what words mean or don't mean, how they're used, how they're used to distort uh, issues, how the party tries always uh, to control, and what terrible problems it gets into while it's doing so. Now that book, China in 10 Words, I could hardly believe that it was published. And I'm not sure that it was published in China, but it was certainly published outside. And Yu Hua certainly uh, continues to live uh, in China and also uh, to publish widely abroad. The third one you'll be proud to hear is from Hong Kong. And this is a gentleman called uh, Chan Kun Chung, who, absolutely li who actually lives in Beijing and has done for a long while, and r has written an extraordinary book called The Fat Years, in which it's a, a history of modern China and the people who go through it, it's fiction. One year is missing, and the year that is missing is 1989. This is a brilliant piece of work. I, 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 I can't quite get my head around this man because I worry about him still living in China, but he seems not to. His book was certainly not published in China. It was published uh, in Hong Kong. And I'm not even sure. I'm pretty sure he, I read it in English, but I'm pretty sure it was probably written originally in Chinese. Um, but he seems to be completely at ease with this kind of writing. 
Now, why I'm mentioning these, I'm mentioning writers only. I could mention filmmakers too, and I could certainly mention artists, um, notably, of course, Ai Weiwei. Uh, but I'm not going to, because I want us to be able to have some discussion as well as to um, uh, just listen to me talking and talking. But somehow or other, the party has failed to control its artists. It's failed to control much of its culture. It certainly can control some aspects of culture which require a huge expenditure, such as um, opera, but it has not managed to get, in the way that it did in the 1950s and 1960s, it hasn't managed to keep the artists uh, under control. And what this leads me to is looking not just in the present, but in the great long history of Chinese culture, Tang poetry, uh, painting, song, song, all kinds of endless examples where the culture has trumped political control. If you look at the Tang Dynasty again, and you think of the famous people of the Tang, you think of the poets, you think of Li Bo, Tai Yang Ming, all kinds of wonderful poets. You don't think of uh, uh, the various uh, rather ferocious emperors uh, you certainly don't think of, um, well, you might want to think of uh, Yang Guifei, because she's remained a, uh, a subject of great interest, but you don't. That's what has survived from the Tang. If you look to at the Yuan Dynasty, the Mongol Dynasty, the greatest things that have survived are the paintings of the period and uh, some of the porcelains of the period. This somehow is always I wouldn't say it's the revenge against dictatorial governments because I don't want to see it like that at all. But it is something that always gives me hope. If I saw now in, uh, in China, if I saw that there was the kind of literary repression that there was in the 50s and 60s, when the only kind of book you could write was something like, Great Change Comes to a Mountain Village, or uh, some very uplifting work, then I would feel, I think, totally depressed. But when I see this kind of thing going on, I feel some hope. When I see even also in my own discipline on the mainland, attempts to rectify various other aspects of the past, and we haven't got to Lusa yet, and I don't think we will, may not do it for a while, uh, but I've actually been quite upset there. There's, um, a complete rewriting of the war with uh, Japan, the resistance war, which uh, again has gone too far for me. A lot of people working on Chiang Kai-shek and saying, you know, he really did great things for China, and in many ways this is a wonderful man. And I say, wait a minute, he did this, this, and this. I've been astonished to find myself. Uh, I've never been a bitter critic of Chiang Kai-shek, but I certainly haven't um, ever praised him. And it's astounding. Uh, I've been several times in recent times to Chongqing, which was the wartime capital, the Peidu, and it's all devoted now. Their entire history is to their, the Kuomintang period. Uh, a lot of other things have happened in Chongqing uh, before and since, but it's now rebranded itself as the capital of uh, resistance. Unfortunately, it's still about the hottest place you can go in China. And so at my age, the, I had a chance to go last year again, and I said, I'm sorry, I just can't cope with Chongqing in August. Uh, and they understood it. I just said, Nian Jin had in a pathetic voice. <laughs> they accepted that, I, that I, I couldn't deal with that heat. Now, the sense that uh, things are being slightly changed. It's still very partial, very very careful. Uh, Chiang Kai-shek has been restored, but some other Chinese leaders who uh, deserve a lot more praise than they've um, got have not yet been fully re restored. We had, um, uh, about six months ago, we had a visit from the writer Bai Shen Yong whose father, Bai Chongxi, was one of the great generals of the war. 
and he still has not had his proper uh, historical uh, re-evaluation. Uh, and there are many other examples I could cite. I want to end by talking about two things. The first of all is to return to the question of memory and of what we call now memory places, or if I was using the exact phrase that I'm supposed to use now, memory scapes. I'm still a bit happier with places than scapes, but I think they mean the same thing. I mentioned already that Tiananmen, the prize of the Communist Party, the first thing that they constructed in the 1950s, a great square and the great buildings around it, and the two great imperial gates at either end, is and remains not only for um, the people of Beijing, but also for outsiders, associated not with the glory of the Communist Party, but with the death of the people who died on and after Liu Si. Ironically, very few of whom actually died in the square. Uh, they died, I'm sure you all know, in many other places. But that square is forever contaminated. And I find that ironic because that square will always be there as a memorial, spoke, unspoken or, or not, of what happened. Meanwhile, to my heartbreak and many other people's, the great economic boom in China has destroyed the old <coughs> Beijing. Those of you, probably not very many of you, knew Beijing uh, when it was still one of the most beautiful cities in the world. It isn't anymore. There are little tiny bits that are preserved, but the great old Beijing with its hutongs and its uh, street life has gone, and now you have a global city which, uh, with the exception of the Forbidden City and a few other things, could actually be almost anywhere. Now that's again one of the tragedies of having a party in control which has absolutely no restraint on it. That's all happened. You can't imagine the possibility of destroying Paris or destroying London because people would be up in arms about it. They would have to go through planning processes. They would have to uh, put in, uh, they'd have to do things in, I always like this, in a sensitive way. But in Beijing, it's just happened. It's happened also in other cities, of course, but not uh, to anything like the extent that old Beijing has been destroyed. And that leads me to my last point, which is an expression of gratitude. And it's an expression of gratitude to people who do care about history and have tried to preserve it, and have tried to preserve it even within Hong Kong. I'm talking about Hong Kong, of course, I've just been, I was in Hong Kong in February and I went to a wonderful place that I'd never even, I'd vaguely seen before from the road but never been to, which is, I hope you'll all go when you go back, if you do a place called Bethany, it's in Pop Fulham, and it's a most beautiful 19th century Catholic mission station, which has just been fully restored uh, by the Hong Kong government taken away from Hong Kong U, so anybody who has associations with Hong Kong U, they're not very happy about it. But they never opened it to, uh, to the public, and now in a most beautiful place with even more beautiful gardens falling down towards uh, the sea. Not falling down literally, but uh, going down in terraces is what I meant by falling down. Hong Kong people have kept the memory of Liu Si going. They have insisted that it not be forgotten. They have insisted year after year in having huge, peaceful, quiet vigils in Victoria Park. There's now, as you all know, a museum in Hong Kong. They have never given up on the idea of patriotism. They've never given up on the idea of democracy. And they show, at the moment, to the people on the mainland what a Chinese society could look like. And I think for that reason, I myself owe them 
a, a, an enormous debt of gratitude. And I'm going to end by saying just what deep respect I have for everything that all of you have done, led by Henry and others. And also just for the people of Hong Kong altogether. It's an extraordinary situation uh, where one group of people have kept a memory alive and make sure that eventually the wrongs of the past will be rectified. Thank you very much.